Coming up on DTNS, ice cream made from real milk without cows, a major quantum computing hurdle may have been passed, and Blair Bazdrich introduces us to the wonders of the robot chameleon. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 16th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Trafalino. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And, and I'm Blair joining us is Blair Bezdrich. Yay! Thank you, Blair. It's good to have you back. <laughs> Thanks. So happy to be here. Uh, of course, uh, Blair, the host of This Week in Science. Uh, we were just uh, chatting with Blair about elephant milk. I tried out some of the non-cow-made ice cream that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, if you want to hear my thoughts on that, good, good day, Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS, where you can join our top patrons like Reed Fishler, Michelle Sergio, and Mike McLaughlin. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration opened a formal investigation into Tesla's autopilot driving system. Of the 31 investigations by the NHTSA into crashes involving autonomous driver assistance systems since 2016, 25 involved Tesla autopilot with 10 deaths reported. The information sources say that Wang Tuzhong Wen technology owned by three Chinese state entities took a 1% stake in ByteDance, the ByteDance China. Chinese entity. Sources also say as part of the deal, the Chinese government can appoint a board director with ByteDance. This would reportedly not give the Chinese government any stake in TikTok. According to a Walmart job listing, the company is looking to hire a cryptocurrency and digital currency product lead senior director. This position will be tasked with developing the digital currency strategy and product roadmap, as well as identifying further investment and partnership opportunities in crypto. Uh, if you uh, undersee internet cable headlines, Amazon and Facebook asked the FCC to approve a cable between the Philippines and California, slated to start operation in late 2022. Google and Facebook announced they will take part in the apricot undersea cable system to link Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, Guam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. That one's planned for 2024. And Facebook China Mobile and MTN Group announced that an expansion of its to Africa undersea cable network for Africa, adding the Seychelles, Comoros, Angola, and a new connection to Nigeria, now set to reach 26 countries. The Connectivity Standards Alliance, one of my favorite alliances, delayed the release of the Matter Smart Home Standard until the first half of 2022, originally planned for late 2021. A rough version of the specification should be ready by the end of 2021 for all of you Matter diehards out there, but the dev kit, first device certifications, and formal certification program are being delayed to match the, quote, expectations of the market. All right, let's talk a little bit more about that no-cow milk. <laughs> Lab-made foods want to be considered technology right alongside chips and wireless protocols. Hence, you see Beyond Meat constantly making announcements at CES. So who are we to resist? New Scientist reports on Perfect Day's lab-made dairy. Perfect Day operates a bioreactor that cultivates genetically engineered fungi, aka, you know, like a mushroom, that contain genes that code for the whey protein, rodan, in cow milk. The whey protein can be filtered out from the fungus, dried and powdered, and then used in cheese and ice cream products. It contains no lactose, or hormones or cholesterol, but it is not suitable for people with a dairy allergy because it's an actual dairy protein. Vegans, get ready for some cheese. It also claims to produce 97% fewer greenhouse gases than a typical dairy. Perfect Day sells Brave Robot ice cream, which I, I tried right before the show, uh, as well as providing materials for Nick's and Grater's brands. And uh, they have partnered with Hong Kong's Ice Age ice cream. So you can, if you can find any of those, you can find the uh, perfect day made ice cream. They plan to release cream cheese by the end of the year. And they're not the only ones either. New Culture is making cheese through a fermentation process that doesn't involve cows. And Turtle Tree Labs makes milk from cultured cells, including human milk for baby humans to drink, people. And this, that's, that's like a formula replacement. So um, I have to say the ice cream wasn't bad. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really exciting kind of 
approach that they're taking here. It, what's interesting is that this is a lot of kind of legacy uh, uh, science that was originally developed in the 70s to kind of at least uh, conceptually get this started. But it seems to have kind of been kickstarted by this alt milk uh, revolution that we, or surge in popularity. The revolution's a little, <laughs> a little grandiose, but that that the surge in popularity that we're seeing with that, the realization that there are a lot of people that, for whatever reason, don't want to or can't drink lactose or, or you know, are looking for you know uh, to reduce the amount of hormones or something in their in their intake and stuff like that. So you know, really kind of putting all that together and making this the science has been possible for a while, but maybe making this more. Uh, uh, feasible for an investment and, and kind of marketability um, uh, perspective as well. Because I mean, it, you know, Tom, that wasn't like a, a like a, a extravagantly expensive ice cream, was it? No, it was like three ninety nine. Uh, you know, maybe maybe a little more expensive than than your 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 you know normal brands, but but not not crazy expensive. More like on the Ben and Jerry's level. Yeah. Okay. It's the question is what makes milk milk. And what makes meat <laughs> meat, right? Because there are things like the lactose, that's a that's a key protein in what part of what makes milk milk. If you take the lactose out, if there never was lactose to begin with, is it still milk? Is and also will the people who don't drink milk because of uh, reasons related to either climate change and environmental impact or how the dairy cows are treated, or is it suddenly okay now? to eat this, which like we've talked before on the show about the, the 3D printed meat and whether I would eat that or not, because I don't eat uh, red meat. And it's I still don't know the answer. I think I would, but it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really tough, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird thing for you to think about. It's a nice thought exercise that's actually coming to pass, which is really interesting. Yeah, and, and this one's a little bit different because with, with the lab-grown meat, it's literally cells, right? It's literally like muscle cells uh, being cultivated. Whereas this is a fungus that's mm -hmm. just making a protein. So does that make you a little more comfortable? I don't know, right? Because it's still it's still the protein, it's still the organic material, but it's not, like you say, it's not the whole milk situation, which could have a whole other bunch of people saying, yeah, so it's not really milk. And maybe there's unforeseen consequences to having just whey protein. It is artificial. It is processed because of that. But I have to say, it tastes like regular ice cream to me. So the whey protein was enough to give it that texture anyway. Yeah. And the New Scientist article did uh, kind of illustrate, I, I mean, it, beyond the tech angle, kind of how this, the, 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 verbiage or I guess uh, uh, the industry, you know, uh, within dairy will kind of ex will relate to this in terms of being like, you know, like the, the US FDA, you know, says has a very specific definition of what is milk and what is milk. Mm -hmm. So whether, you know, whether this will be able to be called milk or, or however we brand this, like I know ice cream has like all these different definitions of what's premium, you know, all these that relate to like cream content and stuff like that. So that may be a, a little bit of a of a trade industry battle about whether we can call this milk or this is you know whatever you want to call it uh, uh, you know perfected fermentation or something like that. I don't think fungus juice is probably yeah. going to be <laughs> sure. number one on there. Uh, but I mean they've they've solved that for pea milk made, milk made from peas. So I mean they can they can figure it out for the fungus. I'm sure. Yikes! Yeah, I know there was a conversation about calling cashew milk and almond milk nut juice for a while. <laughs> Which, I'm glad that didn't stick. <laughs> yeah, the dairy farmers were very much in favor of them calling that. I don't think the almond milk <laughs> makers were so excited about it. All right, well, moving on. Uh, qubits are the basic computing units of quantum computers. Unlike a classical computer, they're not, uh, they're not only ones and zeros there, but also in superposition, allowing them to compute certain things much faster. That pretty much ha answers every question you could possibly have about quantum computing, so I will move on. The qubit has been implemented as the spin of an electron. It's controlled by magnetic fields traditionally delivered by a wire. Drop-off in those fields means only what the electrons closest to the wire can be controlled, which means more wires, which means less room for qubits. The whole thing needs to operate at 270 degrees below zero, uh, Celsius and adding more wires heats things up. So you can see it's just a kind of a constant battle there. Uh, the biggest uh, quantum computer we've had is a Chinese 76 qubit system, although D-Wave has a system that claims an effective 5,000 qubits. We can get into the, the politics of how you count qubits 
uh, uh, you know, Tom, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. Scientists at the University of New South Wales in Sydney published research in the journal Science Advances, however, about a new technique which could expand the number of qubits you can control in a quantum computer into the millions range. The Australian scientists have developed a system that doesn't use wires, but generates the magnetic field from above the chip. It's coming from above the chip, manipulating all qubits simultaneously up to 4 million qubits. The idea for this first surfaced in the 90s, but this is the first time someone's actually developed a practical way of achieving it. The scientists used a crystal prism called a dielectric resonator, which already sounds like it's from the future, to focus the magnetic wavelengths from microwaves to below one millimeter. The system does need a lot of power, so it doesn't generate much heat, and control is evenly spread across the chip. The team experimentally verified the system by controlling millions of qubits at once. They now need to work through some engineering challenges to make it a usable processor. Tom, I know you've been following quantum computers uh, across uh, you know, your your various shows or various years. The advances from you know single qubits into the tens. Uh, excited to see it possibly go into the millions range with this advancement. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to see this become a more practical situation, uh, but it's a, it's a pretty exciting uh, paper nonetheless to say that they've done it. Uh, they still got a lot of techniques to work out to to make it so that you everybody can do it all the time. Uh, but that really does take away one of the big uh, hurdles to creating lots of qubits. And as soon as you can create lots of qubits and power efficiently control lots of qubits, which is what they're they're saying they can do here, suddenly you can make practical quantum computers that aren't eking along and going, well, I think maybe we have quantum supremacy. <laughs> maybe we can solve a, a thing with a quantum computer that you can't with a Newtonian computer and everybody arguing whether it's really true or not. You can just have 4 million qubits and go, oh yeah, there's no doubt this can do things that a classical computer can. That's really exciting. Is it a situation though that, do we need to wait for that 4 million qubit bit or is that if this even allows an expand of like, just like an order, an order of magnitude, you know, say like, you know, into the, into the thousands, ten thousands, is that like where we're going to see, oh, like we're, we're folding all the proteins, we're predicting all the weather. Is that the, the kind of leap and then everything beyond that is, uh, you know, we just kind of expect from the quantum perspective? I mean, I, I think so. You know, I'm not a quantum scientist, <laughs> uh, but from what I can tell, uh, even, even if, even if the engineering of it limits the, the, the amount to a million, you're still well beyond 76, right? You're well beyond <laughs> arguing whether D wave is really controlling 5,000 qubits or not. Uh, so, so the you know the order of magnitude there is 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 huge, and I I think it unleashes a lot, a lot of uses for this. Also, the power efficiency going down means that it could be more widespread. You wouldn't necessarily only have IBM and Google and HP and big companies have these as mainframes. It it would be the same thing that happened when we went from a mainframe computer to a desktop computer, potentially anyway. Yeah, and, and that's the exciting thing is like, we've, we've covered stories where there are, you know, it's a big deal when a quantum computer is being installed in like a business, right? As opposed to like at a research institution or on a corporate campus or something like that. And the fact that, you know, this could op change the power requirements to make it much easier to put these around. Also, like having the number of quantum computers up could also kind of have that effect, not just having one big giant, you know, super powerful one too. All right, speaking of chips, Intel announced its upcoming high performance discrete consumer GPUs will be branded as ARC, A-R-C, not ARK. Intel does have a thing called Intel ARC, ARK, where you can like <laughs> check product designs, but this is ARC, ARC. Uh, Intel has released extremely limited discrete ZDG1 graphics cards before, uh, but ARC will be Intel's first mass market discrete GPU since back in 1998. If y'all remember the i740 GPU back in 1998, that's the last time we had a mass wide consumer one. Uh, the first ARC cards will be released in Q1 2022 based on Intel's ZHPG GPU architecture, codename Alchemist. Intel says they'll support hardware ray tracing. They'll be fully DirectX 12 Ultimate compliant, which means they'll offer graphical goodies like variable rate shading, mesh shaders, sampler feedback. Feature-wise, these should be roughly on par with current AMD and NVIDIA offerings, so they're checking all the boxes. But Intel also said it's working on artificial intelligence-driven super sampling, so similar to NVIDIA's DLSS or AMD's FSR. There's still a lot of unknowns, though. Uh, we don't know what kind of processing node they're going to use. We don't know how many configurations will be offered at launch, uh, to say nothing of any performance metrics, because nobody's gotten to benchmark them. Uh, but 
Intel has already put a roadmap out. So after Alchemist, you're going to get Battle Mage, followed by Celestial, <sighs> followed by Druid. Yes, alphabetical by Fantasy Entity will be the naming of the Intel GPUs. A, a harsh na a harsh veto on the naming chart there, but what's <laughs> in what, what, what's interesting about this is Intel actually has a proud tradition of canceling planned uh, discrete GPUs. They've done it a number of times. I think the most recent was uh, Laramie or Laramie uh, in the mid two or in the I guess uh, late two thousands uh, around there. Uh, this has just been a market they have not been able to crack. The fact that they're coming out with the roadmap itself. I mean, you know, the, you mentioned the, the i740. There were two successors for that. They basically unreleased them. They came out and they were so underwhelming that they kind of took them off the market. Um, Intel's making a lot of hay about, hey, we're, we're going to be making CPUs for other people. We're, we're investing in technology. This kind of, to me, is is key. Well, one of the other key things for them as they continue to expand to not just be the x86 company, obviously a lot of their, I mean, these are consumer cards, but this has a lot of ties to other, uh, you know, kind of GPU computing driven uh, projects. Although that super sampling, not having that seemingly at launch, I think is a big deal. It sounds like that's not like coming down with Battle Mage. I mean, I don't know, but if, if there's a multi-year gap where they're still working on that and an NVIDIA and AMD can kind of you know, have support for that for a long time. I, I feel like that is a pretty significant gap in today's GPU marketplace. Ars Technica seemed to imply that that was coming with Alchemist. Okay. Uh, oh, so okay. I think all there's right. still a little confusion about that as well. Mm. Uh, uh, folks, all next week is DTNS Experiment Week. That's right. Uh, with much of the world out on vacation, we'll be swapping out our normal daily tech news show and trying out some new show ideas each day. So DTNS taken down for the week but cool new stuff coming, like Chris Ashley's barbecue tech show, Jen Cutter on the state of video gaming, Rob Dunwood's second look at tech news, uh, Rich's Ask a Luddite, and a few more. It all starts next week, so be prepared. If you're like, wait a minute, this isn't my normal daily tech news show. It's Experiment Week, August 23rd through the 28th, right here on the DTNS feeds. <laughs> Scientists in South Korea have published an article in the journal Nature Communications about a robot they created that can change its skin color just like a chameleon. Uh, Blair, you brought this story to us, and it's fascinating. Yeah. Is, is this really like a chameleon? How does the system work? Kind of. So uh, chameleons, we actually haven't known for sure how chameleons changed their skin color until pretty recently. It, it was always kind of assumed it was similar to cuttlefish and octopuses and the fact that, you know, they use kind of fluid filled sacs called chromatophores that are teeny tiny and they expand or contract so that from far, from kind of the, the macro angle, they look like they've changed on one color. The chameleons are pretty similar, it turns out. They change colors by rearranging a lattice of nanocrystals in the top layers of their skin. They're called iridophores. So they have these tiny crystals made of guanine. Um, and so they, based on their ordered arrangement and rotation, changes their color re reflection. So the, the, the light reflection, the wavelengths, so that changes what color they appear to be. And so this, this robot um, is pretty similar. Um, they have a, on their top layer of skin, if you want to call it skin, <laughs> <laughs> um, they have a thin glaze of liquid crystal ink, and then it can take on any color depending on the alignment of molecules. So yes, very similar. And so they change based on temperature the way that they they decide what color to be. And so that is a built-in sensor that changes the color of the skin based on the perceived color the, com the robot chameleon is walking on. Yeah, so so it's it's the same technology that's in an LCD television, uh, the mm -hmm. liquid crystals, just implemented yeah. in, in a different way. Uh, and it's it's not as fast. Is it, I understand it's not as fast as a as an actual chameleon no. would be. Maybe? No, definitely not. No, we're not very good at replicating <laughs> natural adaptations, generally speaking. But it's within about a half a second. Uh, it it does change right, faster depending on the temperature of the room around it, and if it's going from hot to cold or cold to hot. So it's easier to heat than to cool down, which makes sense. Um, and so if the if the room is warm, then it's harder to cool it back down to change it into some of those cooler colors. Oh. Yeah, but so of course this has implications for like the military, hunting, wildlife observation, 
lots of potential uh, kind of uses here. Uh, obviously, I, I'm thinking about like a, a, a wildlife um, surveying camera that's on a drone that then is camouflage. This is where my brain goes. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, there's lots of cool implications. It's, it's nowhere near smooth yet. It can't really fully change into patterns yet. It has a few pre-programmed patterns it can handle, but otherwise it, it needs a lot more work before it can be closer to what a chameleon does. Yeah, I mean, looking at, that's the interesting thing is to think about, we, we've, you know, we've kind of made an approximation of how something like magical in nature, were, I mean, not magical, yeah. obviously, but like thinking about what we can do with this. I mean, just the video watching this little robot crawl across this color swatch was just like, it gets your mind spinning. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's like a superhero application to this. That's kind of where my like, <laughs> like my mind went. Like it's, it does seem so science fictiony to to see it in action. Well, it would be for the superhero that can change colors to their environment, but this way they wouldn't have to be naked to do it. They can yeah, have I mean that and clothes. <laughs> That's always, always a benefit <laughs> for yeah. your for your chameleon uh, 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 mutants out there. It's mm -hmm. a it's a relief for sure. Yeah. Uh, and for your MPAA rating when you make the movie. <laughs> yes, that's key. All right. Well, our next story here. Uh, in the first full week of August, Switch games from Nintendo and third parties swept the top 30 best-selling games in Japan, reportedly the first sweep by a single platform since 1988. So it's been a while. Nintendo was behind that, too. Part of this dominance is the continued sales of older titles for Nintendo on the Switch, with the top slot in uh, the week where they swept on the Switch, the uh, the Switch edition of The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, originally reached on the Wii in 2011. The analysts at NPD report that for the U.S., Switch games took nine of the top 20 spots in July. So a strong showing, certainly in the U.S., but uh, not not quite a, a sweep of the top 30 you know, there, there are other games on the chart. Uh, you know, I think Mario Kart, uh, the latest Mario Kart that came out on the Wii U and then was ported over to the Switch is still in like the top 10. Uh, we have, you know, a lot a lot of the classic titles like Splatoon 2, a lot of these semi-launch titles or, or recent releases for the Switch uh, when it first launched uh, are on that list. It seems like, you know, Nintendo has not jumped on the, hey, subscribe to a bunch of Switch game bundles that Microsoft seems to be really getting on the bandwagon on. Uh, you know, the, you still have to pay your 60 bucks for your Switch title pretty much unless you shop the sales. Uh, but working out in terms of game, game sales, uh, at least for now, uh, but just a, a kind of impressive of note to see that top 30 sweep. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I, th I think one of the uh, one of the things that that people will probably point out is you know nintendo doesn't have a subscription service like said uh and and so you know maybe what does that mean for subscription services well it doesn't mean anything because the subscription services account for their money in different ways and are valuable for do in for doing for different way reasons uh and so dominating the charts uh either the charts have to to change or the charts will only be telling you how well for sale games are doing, not how well games are doing in general if people are using subscription services more often. Yeah, and we should point out also that this isn't the first time, uh, Nintendo since 1988 has swept the top 30 in terms of like having all the games, but they've been spread across console generations, whether it's the Game Boy, Fanicom, Super Fanicom, you know, whatever you want to say it. So, because uh, I thought that too, I was like, there had to have been a week where they just had all the releases knocked out of the park, but this is a single console uh, kind of on there. So, you know, uh, a fun little story. And uh, hey, Nintendo, they're still uh, still rocking it. Yeah, they're really good at what they do. <laughs> Take us to space. <laughs> All right, well, we'll finish up here. Uh, NASA's latest International Space Station resupply mission included a machine from the Redwire Regolith Print Project, meant to demonstrate 3D printing using moon or other extraterrestrial rocks, also known as Regolith. This new machine will work with the ISS's existing MAN-D printer to try 3D printing simulated Regolith and testing its strength. If successful, the goal is to someday let space colonists print some of their habitat on demand. So they're right now they're testing on artificial moon rocks, basically, to see if those are going to be strong enough so that they can take this to the moon or Mars and then print real structures out of real moon or Martian rock at some point. Um, kind of cool to have to not take everything with you, maybe be able to build stuff on demand. Uh, that's a game changer when it comes to a lot of planning uh, for, you know, going to other places. This is great. It's I 
I am constantly talking to people about how we keep removing mass from our planet and sending it out into space and how oh, that's a problem. That's we're, we're sending mass away from our planet. You understand like when, when it's in the life cycle here, it doesn't go away, but when we send it into space, it's gone. So this is great that we can actually use matter from the planet that we are hanging out on to create things in space rolling well, on other planets. That, that, that is a really good point because it's one of those problems that's not a big deal right now. The percentage of mass we're sending is is so small. Just like, you know, the percentage of carbon dioxide we were admitting a long time ago was so small. Or <laughs> mm -hmm. the amount of, of sewage you were throwing in the river was so small, right? Like, you maybe want to get ahead of these problems earlier and think about solutions, not not so that you stop putting things into orbit or even sending them to Mars, but when you get to the point where it's industrialized and you're sending a lot of them, you don't have to send them. Because uh, honestly, it's not even just sending our mass into space. It's also just costly to, to lift yeah. it up out of the atmosphere. Wouldn't it be better if you could just print a bunch of stuff once you get there? Here's your snacks and your floppy disk with all of your 3D printing blueprints. There you go, you're done. <laughs> Exactly. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Previously, we talked about the company who makes Plume, uh, a way to optimize Wi-Fi coverage and provide motion detection without cameras. They use the delay in Wi-Fi to tell, oh, an object must have been in the way because we're getting a, a certain pattern of delay. Middle-aged Mike wrote in and said, I was interested to hear your Plume story because I'm a Plume user via my ISP. My ISP is my local electric company. Last year, when I decided to upgrade my service to their one gigabyte synchronous tier, as a part of that tier, you receive a set of three Plume mesh router plugs and access to Plume's premium service. They're easy to set up. You just plug them into a wall. It's about the size of a plug-in air freshener. The plug acts like a Google Nest or Eero mesh network and optimizes your connection with their software. Those we understand it, it's not mesh. And it's kind of the similar idea. Their app is fairly basic outside of setting up your network. There aren't many options. The motion detection has been available since I first installed it, but I've never used it. There is also a setting for the monitoring you and Patrick discussed. They call it privacy mode, but they tell you to leave it off. I have it turned on. I don't care to share my info with my ISP or have Plume protect me from hackers and cyber criminals or monitor my network traffic metadata to do so. All in all, I'm happy with the router. It was free and I have a great standalone network for my media, but don't really trust their privacy mode. I only use the Plume for my streaming devices, TVs, light bulbs, etc. Amazon Prime BritBox, they all know what I'm doing anyway, so I guess I'm giving them metadata about my use of those. All of my computers, my phones, my tablets, are on a separate network that go through a VPN at the router. Uh, signed, one of your loving bosses, middle-aged Mike. Mike, thank you uh, for the for the on-the-ground report about Plume there. That was great. Yeah, you can send uh, any other Feed feedback you have. Back feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, and a special thanks to Russell Manthe, who is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thanks for all your years of support, uh, Russell and Rich. Uh, let's thank Blair. Yes, Blair, thank you so much. Uh, Blair Basrich for being on the show, getting sciencey, talking about uh, all the good stuff. Where can people find more of your great work if they are so inclined? Yeah, you can find out about Twist This Week in Science at Twist Science with one S. You can also watch us every Wednesday at twist.org slash live at 8 p.m. Pacific time, or we are on iTunes and everywhere else you find podcasts as well. And I'm on Twitter as at Blair's Menagerie because most of what I tweet is related to animals. Awesome. Uh, we are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Anna Lee Newitz. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>